This is the first in a series of videos I will be creating based on the book, The Politics of Heroin, CIA Complicity in the Global Drug Trade. This masterpiece was written by Professor Alfred W. McCoy, and it was first published in 1972. And later on, he added several revised versions to the book. And it's a little known book, but it is literally probably the most shocking expose of CIA complicity in the global drug trade that has ever been written. I will also be bringing in information from another important book called Dope Inc. And I will be bringing in information from that book from the 1978 version, which I had difficulty finding. You can find the revised version of that book, but the 1978 version is probably the most explosive and the most revealing. And I've listed both of those sources in the description box underneath this video. So who is Professor Alfred McCoy? Alfred W. McCoy is professor of Southeast Asian history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In 1972, he published an explosive expose of CIA complicity in the global drug trade. And taken with the revised versions that he did later on, he included an analysis of Afghanistan, Southeast Asia, Central America, and Colombia. The original publisher of the book was Harper and Rowe, and the company's president and vice president summoned Dr. McCoy to their offices prior to the publication of the book. This was because of a visit by the CIA's Deputy Director for Plans or Covert Operations, Mr. Cordmeyer Jr., to the president emeritus of Harper and Rowe. Meyer claimed that the book was a threat to national security and asked Harper and Rowe to suppress it. The company's president emeritus refused to do so, but agreed to allow the agency to review the manuscript prior to its publication. The current president, on the other hand, wanted McCoy's immediate consent and was not happy when McCoy asked for time to consider the constitutional questions involved with such an action. He was given 24 hours and opted for a compromise with the company. A procedure was created for how the review by the CIA would be conducted. Investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch then visited the offices of Harper and Rowe, determined to expose the CIA's attempt to suppress the book. The Washington Post also published an editorial attacking the CIA for infringement of freedom of the press. The end result was that the CIA gave Harper and Rowe a review of the book that was filled with undocumented and unconvincing denials. In the book, McCoy asserted that the CIA had allied itself with nationalist Chinese irregulars in Burma to expand opium production, an assertion the CIA simply denied. However, McCoy says that just five months prior to that, he had learned that the CIA spent $2 million to buy and burn the last 26 tons of opium that these same nationalist Chinese mercenaries had hauled out of northern Burma. The CIA then turned to covert methods to suppress McCoy's book. They intimidated his sources in Laos. The FBI tapped his phone. He was audited by the IRS. His graduate school fellowship was investigated. New York Congressman Ogden Reed, a ranking member of the House Foreign Relations Committee, finally sent investigators into Laos to look into the opium situation. But a CIA agent told Hmong leader Ger Su Yang that he had better deny what he had told McCoy about the opium trade in Southeast Asia. As a result, when confronted by congressional investigators, Ger Su Yang lied and denied it all. This is only one example of how McCoy's sources were silenced and Congress was convinced that the CIA was innocent of any wrongdoing. Even three years later, when Congress was holding hearings to investigate CIA assassinations, it did not question the agency about its alliances with leading drug lords. It is important to remember that when Dr. McCoy's book was originally published in 1972, the U.S. government was in the beginning stages of declaring a war on drugs. 
The book has been described as a stunning expose of official hypocrisy because it documents CIA complicity in international drug trafficking both before and after the Cold War. The first expose discussed operations in Burma and Laos. When McCoy updated the book in the 1990s, he added a study of agency protection of cocaine smugglers in its Nicaragua operation. By the time McCoy published the third edition of his book in 2003, he had realized what he called the self-defeating dynamic of America's attempt to prohibit the use of drugs. He used internal documents and interviews to prove that the pattern of CIA protection for its drug lord allies that he discussed in its original 1972 version was later repeated yet again with operations in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989 and then again after the attacks on 9-11 in 2001. McCoy notes that the narcotics trade yielded extraordinary profits and power to those who were able to exploit it. Both opium and coca product profits have had both political and economic impact on the U.S. and the world. Opium is extracted from the poppy plant. It has a long history of cultivation. This history extends back to societies in the ancient Mediterranean before spreading into China by the 8th century AD. Eventually, a distinctive opium zone was established that stretched for 5,000 miles across Asia. At first, it was a legal drug, but has become an illicit narcotic. McCoy says that in 1996, over 96% of the world's 280,000 hectares of illicit opium was found in this zone, which was concentrated around a region known as the Golden Triangle, made up of Burma, Thailand, and Laos, and the Golden Crescent, made up of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran. Years later, the pattern set in this Asian opium trade would be repeated in the coca zone of the Andes Mountains in South America. Three main drugs are made out of the opium poppy. These are opium, morphine, and heroin. McCoy names three distinct phases in the history of its consumption. The first users were members of ancient societies who used the drug for medicinal purposes and traded locally. By the 17th century, it was being used as a recreational drug and traded as a global commodity. In the 20th century, it was being smuggled long distances and netting huge profits to traffickers. The commercial value of opium was first discovered by European merchants. In order to understand the modern opium era, which began in 1773, it is necessary to have some background on the British East India Company, which imposed a monopoly over the production and sale of opium. By this method, British merchants gained control over a profitable triangular trade among India, China, and Europe. The main source for information which follows is a book called Dope, Inc., Britain's Opium War Against the United States, and I've listed it in the sources below. This book first came out in 1978, and it has had several revisions since then. Its original publication put Executive Intelligence Review on the media spotlight, and along with The Politics of Heroin by Alfred McCoy, has established the international narcotics trade as a major topic of interest. This book examines the international trade in narcotics, emphasis on opium and heroin. It argues that this trade did not arise naturally, but was created by the British Empire first to subdue China and now against the United States. The book has three authors, and they draw on hundreds of references across multiple languages and origins to piece together the world's narcotics trade. By following the money and seeing who is related to who, they show that many big banking institutions in the world were established partially or even solely to facilitate the narcotics trade and related activities of money laundering, tax evasion, smuggling, racketeering, and fraud. The book ties together such characters as the mob leader Meyer Lansky in the U.S., 
the Bronfen family of Canada, the Matheson family in the UK, and even early communist leaders in China, such as Zhou and Lai. So what is going to follow now is the brief lesson that I used to present when I was teaching to my high school students a brief history of the British East India Company and how it got involved in China in two wars that have since been dubbed the Opium Wars. So what is the British East India Company? In 1600, a group of British businessmen approached Queen Elizabeth I and asked her for a royal charter to start a trading company. They wanted to voyage to the East Indies, or India, in exchange for a monopoly on trade. The merchants put up 70,000 pounds of their own money to finance the operation. In 1613, the British East India Company had made a treaty with the Mughal Emperor of India, and the corporation set up its first factory in Western India. The representatives who were left behind in India established trading posts and negotiated for various goods. Over the years, the company traded in spices, silk cloth, and tea, and the company eventually expanded into the Persian Gulf, China, and elsewhere in Asia. Between 1600 and 1874, the company became the most powerful corporation in the world. It had its own army and its own territory and a near monopoly on the tea trade. The company's royal charter gave it the ability to wage war, and at first it used its ability to defend itself and fight off its competition. In 1757, the company seized control of the entire Indian state of Bengal. The company had a 3,000-man army and was able to drive the French and Dutch out of India. The governor of the territory, Robert Clive, began collecting taxes, buying Indian goods, and exporting them to Britain. The company continued to take over more territory in India. It took these areas over by force or by making alliances with local leaders whose territory they were unable to conquer. At one point, the army was 260,000 strong, or twice the size of Britain's standing army. The entire Indian subcontinent was at one point under the rule of the corporation's shareholders. In 1857, there was a serious rebellion among the sepoys or Indian soldiers of the British East India Company. And as a result, Britain decided as it put down the sepoy rebellion or the sepoy mutiny to take direct control of the colony of India. The British East India Company eventually began growing opium in India. In 1715, it opened up its first Far East office in the Chinese port city of Canton. The British Crown was finding that its treasury was rapidly being drained of silver reserves because silver was the only payment the Chinese emperor would accept in exchange for silk, tea, and other commodities that Britain imported. This became a problem that threatened to collapse the financial underpinnings of the British Empire. King George III mandated the East India Company to begin shipping large quantities of opium from Bengal in the British Crown Colony to China. By the time of the American Revolution, in 1776, East India Company opium trafficking into China was officially reported to be at a scale 20 times the absolute limit of opium required for medical and related use. Adam Smith, in his book, The Wealth of Nations, advocated a massive increase of East India Company opium exporting into China. This was part of his scheme to defend the British Empire. By the 1820s, a network of trading companies operating under the East India Company control was founded to facilitate the trade. By 1830, 
1831, the number of chests of opium brought into China increased fourfold to 18,956 chests. In 1836, it climbed to more than 30,000 chests. Between 1829 and 1840, a total of 7 million silver dollars entered China, while 56 million dollars left due to the soaring opium trade. In 1839, the Chinese emperor imported, appointed a commissioner of Canton to lead a campaign against opium because it was causing so much addiction in the country. The company was sponsoring triad gangs to smuggle drugs out of the factory area into the pores of the community. The triad society was also known as the Society of Heaven and Earth and was a century old feudalist religious cult that had been suppressed by the Manchu dynasty of China for its often violent opposition to the government's reform programs. The triad group in Canton was cultivated by Jesuit and Church of England missionaries and recruited into the East India Company's opium trade by the early 19th century. When the commissioner of Canton, Lin C. Su, moved to arrest one of the British nationals employed through the opium merchant houses, Crown Commissioner Captain Charles Elliott intervened to protect the drug smuggler with Her Majesty's fleet. When Lin responded by laying siege to the factory warehouses holding the tea shipments about to sail for Britain until the merchants turned over their opium stockpiles, Elliot assured the British drug pushers that the Crown would take full responsibility for covering their losses. Matheson of the Jardine Matheson and Company Limited Opium House wrote to his partner Jardine in London about how to pursue the pending war with China. He concluded the letter by saying, I suppose war with China will be the next step. On October 13, 1839, Prime Minister Palmerson of Great Britain sent a secret dispatch to Crown Commissioner Captain Charles Elliott, informing him that an expeditionary force proceeding from India would reach Canton by March 1840. In a follow-up secret dispatch dated November 23rd, Palmerston provided detailed instructions on how Elliot was to proceed with negotiations with the Chinese once they had been defeated by the British fleet. The Chinese forces, decimated by 10 years of rampant opium addiction within their imperial army, would prove no match for the British. Demands were outlined by Jardine in a memo dated October 26, 1839. The opium pusher demanded full legalization of opium trade into China, compensation for the opium stockpiles confiscated by Lin at a price of 2 million pounds, territorial sovereignty for the British crown over several designated offshore islands, and in a simultaneous memo to the Prime Minister, Jardine placed J&M's entire opium fleet at the disposal of the Crown to pursue war against China. The British fleet arrived in force and laid siege in June of 1840. Its threat to the northern cities of China, especially Nanking, forced the Chinese emperor to terms. The emperor petitioned for a treaty to end the war. The Treaty of Chen Pai in 1841, when Elliot forwarded to Palmerston a draft of the Treaty of Chen Pai in 1841, the Prime Minister rejected it, saying, After all, our naval power is so strong that we can tell the Emperor what we mean to hold rather than what he should say he would cede. Palmerston ordered Elliot to demand admission of opium into China as an article of lawful commerce, increased indemnity payment of 21 million pounds in silver, British access to several additional Chinese ports, and control over the free port of Hong Kong. The first opium war defined the proliferation of and profiteering from mind-destroying drugs as an important tool in the tool chest of British imperial policy. 
In January of 1841, Lord Palmerston wrote this to Lord Auckland, then the Governor General of India. The rivalship of European manufacturers is fast excluding our productions from the markets of, of Europe, and we must unremittingly endeavor to find in other parts of the world new vents for our industry, i.e. opium, if we succeed in our China expedition. Abyssinia, Arabia, the countries of the Indus, and the new markets of China will at no distant period give us a most important extension to the range of our foreign commerce. This is what the Encyclopedia Britannica, published in 1977, has to say about Lin Si Su, the leader of the Chinese emperor's fight to defeat the British drugging of the Chinese population. He, Lin, did not comprehend the significance of the British demands for free trade and international equality, which were based on their concept of a commercial empire. This concept was a radical challenge to the Chinese world order, which knew only an empire and subject peoples. In a famous letter to Queen Victoria, written when he arrived in Canton, Lin asked if she would allow the importation of such a poisonous substance into her own country and requested her to forbid her subjects to bring it into his. Lin relied on aggressive moral tone, Meanwhile, proceeding relentlessly against British merchants in a manner that could only insult their government. So you can tell the propaganda spin of the Encyclopedia Britannica regarding the whole venture into forcing opium into the country of China as a result of British imperialism. Not very long after the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, the British Crown began a second offensive against China. The Second Opium War also had disastrous consequences for the Chinese and similar monumental profits for London's drug pushers. Out of the Second Opium War, the British merchant banks and trading companies established the Hong Kong and Shanghai Corporation, which to this day serves as the central clearinghouse for all Far Eastern financial transactions related to the black market in opium and the heroin that is made from it. And that comes right out of the book Dope, Inc., Britain's Opium War Against the United States by a U.S. Labor Party investigating team, the 1978 version. Prior to the ordering of a northern campaign against Peking, Lord Palmerston wrote to his friend, Foreign Secretary Lord John Russell, We must in some way or other make the Chinese repent of the outrage, referring to the defeat suffered by a British-French expeditionary force at Taku Forts in June 1859. The fleet, acting on orders to seize the forts, had run aground in the mud-bogged harbor, and several hundred sailors attempting to wade to shore were either killed or captured. We might send a military naval force to attack and occupy Peking, Palmerston wrote. The Times of London then published an article which said that, England with France, or England without France if necessary, shall teach such a lesson to these perfidious hordes that the name of Europe will hereafter be a passport of fear, if it cannot be of love throughout their land. In October 1860, the joint British-French expeditionary force laid siege to Peking and the city fell within a day with almost no resistance. British commander Lord Elgin ordered the temples and other sacred shrines in the city sacked and burned to the ground to show Britain's absolute contempt for the Chinese. Within four years of the signing of the Treaty of Tientsin on October 5, 1860, Britain was in control of seven-eighths of the vastly expanded trade into China. Over the next 20 years, the total opium export from India, most of which was still being funneled into China, went from 58,681 chests in 1860 to 105,508 chests in 1880. The opening of China prompted the British opium traders to get into other 
legitimate businesses like cotton cloth. What were the terms of the Treaty of Tientsin? Britain imposed a new set of rules for international commerce. The treaty, along with the Treaty of Nanking, forced China to lower its tariffs or taxes on imported goods to 5% so that European goods would be cheaper for the Chinese to buy. It also forced China to open five additional ports to foreign trade. Additionally, Westerners accused of crimes in China were to be tried according to Western laws by officials from their own home countries. This was called extraterritoriality. The Opium Wars were a devastating defeat for China, and as a result, China was greatly weakened and rebellions became frequent in the 19th century. And I'll end this introductory video with a quote from The Politics of Heroin, which could be found uh, on page five in the introduction. By 1900, China's population of 400 million included an estimated 13.5 million opium addicts who consumed 38,000 tons of smoking opium annually. This made China the world's largest consumer and also the largest harvester of opium. It produced over 35,000 tons of opium, over 85% of the world's total.